Hello, boys and ghouls, and welcome to my laboratory of horrors. <laughs> okay, okay, except for Fred. Um, top tip, if uh, you guys are ever being chased by zombies, they will stop in their tracks if they hear salsa music. The problem is they'll never leave. So I, I can either stop playing the music and Fred will eat my brains, or I can just keep playing the music. And I guess Fred's just gonna, he's been here for a while now. Fred, could you just go over in the corner, please? Um, thank, thank you. All right, anyhow, welcome to the Laboratory of Horror. So I only use this laboratory for special things. And that means I wanna try an experiment that's going to defy the natural laws of Earth. And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm gonna to show you something that is completely contrary to every physical process we've talked about. So what I'm gonna do, I have here a very spooky old bottle with some organic kombucha was in here, but it's, it's now filled with ghoulish water. I'm pretty sure this was filtered water. Anyhow, what I'm going, no, no, actually this is a laboratory of horrors, but we could still make a mess. So let's, let's, let's be careful here. Okay, so that goes in there. Okay, now we're going to try this experiment. So here I have a ordinary ping pong ball, and here I have a glass of water, or a bottle of water. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place the ping pong ball on top of the opening. I'm going to tilt this upside down, and yes, some water might might spill out, but if I let go, magic. I have now defied the laws of gravity. I have all of this water pushing down on this ping pong ball and it won't move. You can see I can twist it around and it doesn't come out. Although sometimes it does, which is why I have this here. But anyhow, you guys already know hydrostatic pressure, right? You know that this column of water has pressure. It is pushing down on this ball, but it's not moving. So magic. I have summoned the powers of the beyond. Okay, no, I haven't, right? This actually isn't magic. You guys probably knew that. There's some real physical processes going on here and stuff that you already knew. So, okay, it is true. We have an entire column of water pushing down on this ping pong ball. And by the hydrostatic pressure equation, you know that it is based on the height of that water. Well, if the ping pong ball is not moving, something's holding it up and it's not me. So what could be doing that? The something else is pushing against the bottom to hold that ping pong ball in place. In fact, it would take a glass bottle nearly 35 feet tall to push that ping pong ball out. Why is that? Well, I'm gonna flip this back up just in case it doesn't work. And you can see it was just sitting there. Well, as it turns out, you may not feel it, but the atmosphere is constantly putting pressure on you. Now, actually, it might feel that way, especially in this class, you might feel stressed and some of your other classes and you've got homework and you've got a job and you've got a girlfriend, a boyfriend, and you just, things are going crazy. So it feels like a lot of pressure. Anyhow, I'm, I'm getting off track. The point is the atmosphere is putting pressure on you and it is putting pressure against that ball to hold it in place. And this phenomenon, this very real physical phenomenon, is something that we use every day, all right? It is something actually incredibly helpful. The brakes in your car work on this principle, something called hydraulics. So what we're gonna do, let's see if we can explain this a little bit. And I'm gonna sort of set this aside here so I don't make a mess. So the way this works, let's pretend we have two columns of liquid. All right, and we know by the hydrostatic pressure equation, these, the pressure at the bottom is equal to the density of whatever fluid that is, times gravity, times the height of that column. Well, something really amazing. If I attach these two columns at the bottom, and I give those fluids a bit of time to level out, they're not necessarily at the same height. However, the pressure at the bottom where they connect is exactly the same. So the hydrostatic pressure equation, so pressure based on a, a, a column of fluid, the pr if they're connected, they will always have the same pressure where they're connected. Now, the reason this becomes very useful 
is for a couple things, all right? So say, again, you have these two columns connected, right? We know that pressure is the same, so we can set these two equations equal to each other. Well, we know gravity is the same, okay? Well, we're doing this experiment on Earth. There's nothing spooky about the gravity in my laboratory. So gravity doesn't change. And the density, they might be different densities, they might be the same density. Um, in this case, obviously, they're different because the heights are different. So sort of like a seesaw, the density and height will shift back and forth, keeping pressure exactly the same. Now, why is this useful? What is so amazing about this? Well, as it turns out, if I know everything about one column and nothing about the other column, I still know the pressure. So last time I asked you guys, hey, how on earth, no pun intended, can we calculate the atmospheric pressure at any given place? Because I already told you that the density in the atmosphere isn't constant. So unlike the ocean, unlike water, we can't just assume a constant density. So in this case, in these two columns, density goes out of one side. We have no idea what that is. We know nothing. And well, height is not exactly uh, leveled off either. Right? The atmosphere just goes up and gets less and less dense until you get into space. So if we want to find the pressure of the atmosphere at any given place, we have to connect it to something we know. So I just showed you, I'm going to try it again here, that if I take this and I flip it upside down, what that means is the pressure on the ping pong ball is greater than the pressure of the water. And I already told you that this would take an incredible column of water, like 35 feet tall, uh, to equal that pressure. So what we can do is something a little more manageable. All right, we can, we can take these two columns, we can, let's say, take one of them and just open it up, right? We'll just open it up to the atmosphere. And what's really happening is an entire column all the way from space down is pushing on that area. And it's pushing against the fluid in the other column. Well, it's not really manageable to carry around a 35 foot tall column in your pocket. So we have to use something else. We have to use something that's a lot more dense. And generally, a barometer is what these are called to measure atmospheric pressure contains mercury because mercury is a liquid metal and it's incredibly, incredibly dense. So what we can do with this is if we carry around our little column of mercury wherever we go, we can measure the height difference and that will tell us the pressure. So gravity doesn't change, right? Density doesn't change because we know a constant density of mercury. So the only thing that's going to change is that height. And when that height changes, we can assume that the pressure changes. And when that pressure changes, we know the atmospheric pressure changes. So with that, you guys now know how we measure atmospheric pressure and how weathermen can tell where there's going to be high pressure and low pressure and where those winds move. And now we can talk about something to do with storms, right? Storms, these amazing, intense, energy intensive, short duration uh, phenomena that affect the coastline. So stay tuned. Um, I think that's all I need the spooky laboratory for. And we'll come back and we'll talk about storms. Welcome back, everyone. Now, I don't want you to worry too much. Fred's just fine. Um, I found a Spotify playlist of salsa music that I put on continuous loop, and he's just entertaining himself. But anyhow, so what we want to do is we want to move on and we want to talk about storms, right? So storms, these are incredibly powerful atmospheric occurrences. Now, unlike other oceanographic processes that we've talked about, these are short duration, okay? Heavy impact, very short duration, but they still affect the coastline. And they affect the coastline using a lot of the same thing. So high waves, heavy currents, heavy winds, right? They just pound the shore, again, for that short period of time, but they can have lasting impact. In fact, if uh, you guys were around for Superstorm Sandy, uh, I can walk out here to the bay and still see really large rocks, boulders, high up on the shoreline, still there from Sandy, right? Nothing else has come around quite as powerful to come up and, and collect those rocks. So they're still sitting there. So a lot of changes. Um, now, 
these storms, again, they're very powerful. They should be taken very seriously. And, you know, you don't want to go out in a storm. Although I will say that sometimes um, some people seem to have a lack of concern for just how dangerous it is. But you and I know that this is something to be um, taken with care, okay? So how does this work? You know, why are we talking about storms? We've already said they shape the coastline. And again, you know, we're back in the atmosphere, just showing you that the ocean and atmosphere are highly intertwined. And if we go back into the atmosphere, we see something like this, okay? Now, just like in the ocean, we have something called air masses, like water masses. So you can see, and again, the names of these aren't particularly important for you um, for now, just to know that this is a large body of air with nearly uniform temperature, humidity, density, right? Um, sometimes pressures, but the air mass really is about that temperature, humidity, and density. And you can see here, you know, we have things like the maritime polar, which is um, no, I guess she doesn't say anything. So continental fold, that's yeah, cold and dry, very cold and dry, warm and moist, okay? So these are very stable air bodies, so these air masses. Now the thing with this, because of their properties, one thing to note is um, they're going to collide, okay? And what happens, you guys may have seen this, we get something called a front. Okay, so a front is a boundary between two air masses. So you see here this, this cold, dry air mass. Well, if it was moving to the south, you would get this, a cold front. And again, you guys may have seen this, you know, this blue line with the blue triangles on it. That just means there's a cold air mass moving in that direction, the direction of the uh, triangles. Well, in the same vein, we get something called a warm front. So if I had this warm, moist air down here, and if it were, yeah, and I totally, let's just understand that I'm gonna be a weatherman for this one. So this warm, moist air is moving from the south, and what you get is a warm front, right? This red line with the semicircles on it, and that's how we denote it. Again, if you watch the news or you just look at any kind of meteorological forecast, you're gonna see these fronts. Well, the thing about these fronts is they don't like to mix. So sort of like in the ocean where we, you know, we say the ocean is stratified by density. We have there, there are strong gradients. Well, these air masses are very strong too. And it takes a lot of energy to mix them up. Um, also, when they do mix, there's a lot of energy involved. And sometimes it releases and we get storms, okay? And this can happen in a few ways. And we're going to talk about these uh, a little bit. So the first thing, we'll talk about these fronts, okay? So a cold front and a warm front. Well, you guys already know that uh, if you have a warm air and cold air, we know because of density that warm air is going to want to be on top, right? The lower density is going to sit on top because, again, we're going to have that stratification based on density. Well, if they're coming at each other, what that means is they're, they're on the same level. And what's going to have to happen is one of them is going to have to give. So if you end up with a cold front, so say you have this, this cold air mass right here, okay, and it's moving this way towards a warmer air mass. Well, what that's going to do, it's almost like a bulldozer. It's going to push its way underneath that warm air mass, okay? And what you're going to end up with because of this is a storm, okay? Pretty heavy precipitation in a, in a cold front coming through. Because of the differences in humidity and temperature, you're going to get storms, okay? There's differences in pressure, so you're going to get those winds. Um, and then in the same way, with a warm front, you're going to get a similar phenomenon. So if on this side now I have this uh, warm air mass, well, instead of being like a bulldozer, it's going to be more like a ramp. It's going to go up on top of that colder air mass. And you're still going to get some storms, not quite as heavy as a cold front. But importantly, this is what happens when the two air masses mix. All right, so your um, cold fronts have that cold air pushing in like a bulldozer. You get pretty heavy precipitation, and a warm air mass slides on top of the cold air mass and some precipitation. But this is where we get those frontal storms. Now, again, this isn't a meteorology class. It's mostly all I'm going to say about this. But one thing that's kind of fun to notice, um, I don't know how many of you use like gel deodorant or any kind of, I, I just say deodorant because this is one I notice all the time. Well, if you happen to go into your medicine cabinet in the morning and you notice that some of it has squirted out, well, that means the pressure lowered. And what that can sometimes tell you is, hey, there's a storm coming, right? Because there's changes in pressure. And it's just kind of fun to, to look at. Something else you'll notice too is if you guys just start observing it, when we get a storm coming through, you may notice that before and after that storm, the air temperature and humidity change. We may go from this warm, muggy, humid weather to all of a sudden it's crisp and cool after a storm or vice versa. 
And then you'll actually know, hey, did a warm front come through or a cold front? All right, well, something else besides just a front uh, can happen. We can get more powerful storms. And sometimes if you have a storm that um, is within or across air masses, you get, and it rotates, it's something called a cyclonic storm. So a hurricane, right? These massive, powerful storms are cyclonic. They're rotating air masses of low pressure within or between um, fronts, or not between fronts, but between these air masses. And I say within or across, and I'll show you what I mean. So there's two specific types of these cyclonic storms. The first one is a tropical cyclone, and the second one is an extra tropical cyclone. Now, don't worry too much about the tropical, meaning where they are. I mean, they do have a bit to do with where they came from and stuff, but we're not too worried about that. The important part here is that the tropical cyclone, which is like a hurricane, um, is centered around this low pressure. All right, so there's a low right in the middle, and these winds spot around. Now, if you guys remember when we talked about gyres, you can start to figure out why these spiral, right? We know those gyres move around that area of high pressure. Well, this is sort of the same thing. Now you have an area of low pressure where all that wind's gonna wanna come towards, but it can't meet in the middle, it's gotta spiral around, okay? So symmetric around that low pressure center, there's no fronts or anything like that. This is all on its own, and it's driven by warm water temperature. So if you guys have seen, you know, when they talk about these hurricanes hitting land, they start to lose their strength. That's because they gain so much strength from being over that warm water. Um, the other kind is extratropical, and these actually happen across fronts. So you can see here is this uh, cold front, and here's a warm front. So we know we have this moist warm air mass here, and then out here is a cold, usually dry air mass. And then when those two get together, um, again, when you have two fronts like this, they can start to spin and they can create powerful storms. So again, some things like nor'easters, we get up here a lot. This is an extra tropical cyclone, these spinning storms, but not necessarily like a hurricane. So they have a cold section and a warm section, and they're driven by that uh, horizontal temperature differences, okay, which in turn creates those pressure differences. And speaking of pressure, we now know how we measure atmospheric pressure. So when you see something like this, right, this is obviously a picture of the Earth, and you guys may have seen this, all these lines drawn on here with these numbers. Well, what this means is these are these areas of, here's a low, right, 998, I think these are bars or millibars. Um, here's a high, right? They don't differ that much, but there's definitely a difference. And these high and low pressures um, are their own sort of entity, okay? And this is where we get that current flow, that air current flow. This is where wind comes from, okay? And we've already talked about this a bit, but now you see how we measure this, how we can actually make a figure like this and know without even being there, okay, well, if I have a high, let's go up here. If I have a high pressure here and a low pressure here, I know that wind is gonna be moving north. It's gonna be moving in that direction. And if we have a really intense low pressure, that brings us back to our tropical storm, right? All that wind's gonna start moving this way and it's just gonna start spinning around, okay? So these are those highs and low pressures around the planet. Um, and we use those barometers to measure this and see where these storms happen. Um, and the closeness of these lines, you guys see like down here, you know, the, their lines are pretty spread apart, but then you get up here and they're really close together. Well, you can think of that like um, a steep drop off, all right? And how fast are you gonna go? So the closer these lines are together, the steeper that drop off. And if you roll something down it, it's gonna move a lot faster. And that's the same with winds. So the closer those lines are together, the faster and more powerful those winds are going to move. Okay, so now we've talked about um, how we measure pressure, then we know wind direction. We also now understand the different kinds of storms. So we have between fronts, we have these air masses, um, and we have these cyclonic storms. And all of these, again, are going to affect the coastline, right? The winds are going to shape the coastline, definitely the waves and currents. Well, one more feature, um, and you guys may have heard of this, it's incredibly important with storms, is something called a storm surge. All right, so let's say, let's take a side view of one of these cyclonic storms, okay? So this is looking at the side, here are these um, you know, bands of clouds, here's the eye in the middle, all right? And it's rotating you know, like this way, okay? So you're looking at it from the side, and down here is the surface of the ocean. Well, we already said that right in the center is a low pressure. So if I have a low pressure here, 
and we know that fluids want to move from high pressure to low pressure, well, what's going to happen is the surface of the ocean is actually going to bump up a little bit. Not a whole lot. I mean, you wouldn't be able to look out and see it. But over these massive areas, it can be quite a bit. So you get this hump of water. And then as this storm moves onto shore, that hump of water is like a giant wave, OK? Um, sort of. <laughs> it's more like just a giant hump of water that's going to come onto shore. And what this means is wherever your normal high tide is, this is even higher. Okay, And this is why um, when these big storms happen, everybody's so concerned with the storm surge because it can be so much higher than we're used to. Right? It can bring water. Again, I look at Superstorm Sandy and some of the damage that was caused by the water actually coming ashore. That's not waves. It's this low pressure hump of water moving itself onto shore. Um, all right, so all of this combined, why are these important? Why are we talking about storms? Um, we're talking about local changes to the coastline, right? Remember all this stuff about coastlines um, shifting over time. And the local changes, we started with waves, which is just this you know, constant inundation of, of water hitting the shore. Well, storms is this really short duration, high energy. And it brings waves. It brings precipitation, wind, and that storm surge. Um, so we're going to move on from there, and we're going to talk about the last local change that we're going to do in this module, and that's tides. Now, tides is really interesting, almost the opposite of storms. The storms are obvious. You know a storm's there. It's pretty evident that storms are shaping the coast. But tides are a little different. They're always there, right? Even waves come and go. Tides are always there, and they're slow, at least as far as uh, we notice in a day. You don't see it as much. But over a geologic time, they can be very fast, and they actually have a lot to do with shaping the coastline. So what I want you guys to do is a couple things. First, I want to explain, you do have, uh, you know, going back to the explanation of how barometers work and those differences in pressure, there are some questions for you to work out. Make sure you look at those early. Ask me if you have questions. Um, I want to see, you know, same stuff. You guys have seen the homework, the homework assignments graded now. Always have an equation. Always have your units. I, it kills me to take off points for this stuff. Take a lot of time. Don't start these assignments, you know, 20 minutes before they're due. Get on them early and come to me with questions. I'm happy to help. Um, so work on that. But then, of course, as it's becoming rather commonplace, I do have a question for you. And I did say we're going to move on to tides next time. And what I want you guys simply to tell me is where do tides come from? What is the force driving tides? And that's pretty much it. So I hope you guys had a great Halloween. Um, I certainly had a bit of fun here and uh, even my attempt at socially distant spookiness and come to me for office hours, take a look at your assignments, do your reading, watch the videos, and I'll see you guys next time when we actually talk about tides and, you know, maybe a little uh, rocket science. See you then.